Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the June 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of On the Question of Dialectics by Lenin from 1915. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So, this was written in 1915. The source is Lenin's Collected Works, 4th edition, Moscow, 1976, volume 38. Publisher is Progress Publishers. It was first published in 1925 in Bolshevik, numbers 5 and 6. Translated by Clements Dutt, edited by Stuart Smith. Original HTML transcription and markup by R. Cymbala and Mark Shevchek. Remarked up and proofread by K. Goins, 2007, and it's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive at marxists.org. Thanks, as usual, to the Marxists Internet Archive for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Please go check them out. So there's a note here. This fragment on the question of dialectics, it's not really a full piece, is contained in a notebook between the conspectus of LaSalle's book on Heraclitus and the Conspectus of Aristotle's Metaphysics. It was written in 1915 in Bern. Note that this document has undergone special formatting to ensure that Lenin side notes fit on the page, marking as best as possible where they were located in the original manuscript. So you can see there an example of what we're talking about on the screen. I don't usually put screenshots of the text itself on the screen, but in this case, I think it's important and it's a short piece, so I will do that. On the longer pieces, it's really just not practical to put screenshots of everything. One final note, if this is the first piece of Marxist theory, history, any kind of, you know, socialist writing that you're engaging with, please stop and pick another, honestly. <laughs> this is a fragment, it is undeveloped, and it sounds way more confusing than it needs to be, especially for a beginner. I would absolutely not recommend starting with this piece it is kind of uh, more advanced in many ways. Instead, literally pick almost anything else on the channel. Also, I will be putting in the video description and a pinned comment some other suggestions on the same topic of dialectical thinking. All right, so let's get into the audiobook. The splitting of a single whole and the cognition of its contradictory parts. See the quotation from Philo on Heraclitus at the beginning of section 3 on cognition in LaSalle's book on Heraclitus, is the essence, one of the essentials, one of the principal, if not the principal, characteristics or features of dialectics. That is precisely how Hegel, too, puts the matter. Aristotle, in his Metaphysics, continually grapples with it and combats Heraclitus and Heraclitean ideas. The correctness of this aspect of the content of dialectics must be tested by the history of science. This aspect of dialectics, e.g. in Plekhanov, usually receives inadequate attention. The identity of opposites is taken as the sum total of examples, quote, for example, a seed, quote, for example, primitive communism. The same is true of Engels, but it is, quote, in the interests of popularization, and not as a law of cognition, and as a law of the objective world. In mathematics, positive and negative, differential and integral. In mechanics, action and reaction. In physics, positive and negative electricity. In chemistry, the combination and dissociation of atoms. In social science, the class struggle. The identity of opposites. It would be more correct, perhaps, to say their unity, although the difference between the terms identity and unity is not particularly important here. In a certain sense, both are correct. Is the recognition or discovery of the contradictory, mutually exclusive, opposite tendencies in all phenomena and processes of nature, including mind and society. The condition for the knowledge of all the processes of the world in their self-movement, in their spontaneous development, in their real life, is the knowledge of them as a unity of opposites. Development is the struggle of opposites. The too basic, or too possible, or too historically observable, conceptions of development evolution are development as decrease and increase, as repetition, and development as a unity of opposites, the division of a unity into two mutually exclusive opposites, and their reciprocal relation. In the first conception of motion, self-movement, its driving force, its source, its motive, remains in the shade, or this source is made external, 
God, subject, etc. In the second conception, the chief attention is directed precisely to knowledge of the source of, quote, self movement. The first conception is lifeless, pale, and dry. The second is living. The second alone furnishes the key to the, quote, self-movement of everything existing. It alone furnishes the key to leaps, to the break in continuity, to the, quote, transformation into the opposite, to the destruction of the old and the emergence of the new. The unity, coincidence, identity, equal action, of opposites is conditional, temporary, transitory, relative. The struggle of mutually exclusive opposites is absolute just as development and motion are absolute. The distinction between subjectivism, skepticism, sophistry, etc., and dialectics, incidentally, is that in objective dialectics, the difference between the relative and the absolute is itself relative. For objective dialectics, there is an absolute within the relative. For subjectivism and sophistry, the relative is only relative and excludes the absolute. In his capital, Marx first analyzes the simplest, most ordinary and fundamental, most common and everyday relation of bourgeois or commodity society, a relation encountered billions of times, viz. the exchange of commodities. In this very simple phenomenon, in this, quote, cell of bourgeois society, analysis reveals all the contradictions, or the germs of all contradictions, of modern society. The subsequent exposition shows us the development, both growth and movement, of these contradictions and of this society in the sum of its individual parts, from its beginning to its end. Such must also be the method of exposition, i.e. study of dialectics in general, for with Marx the dialectics of bourgeois society is only a particular case of dialectics. To begin with what is the simplest, most ordinary, common, etc., with any proposition, the leaves of a tree are green, John is a man, Fido is a dog, etc., here already we have dialectics, as Hegel's genius recognized. The individual is the universal. There is a note there with some long quotes in other languages. I will leave that to people to look up. Continuing. Consequently, the opposites, the individual is opposed to the universal, are identical. The individual exists only in the connection that leads to the universal. The universal exists only in the individual and through the individual. Every individual is, in one way or another, a universal. Every universal is a fragment or an aspect or the essence of an individual. Every universal only approximately embraces all the individual objects. Every individual enters incompletely into the universal, etc., etc. Every individual is connected by thousands of transitions with other kinds of individuals, things, phenomena, processes, etc., here already we have the elements, the germs, the concepts of necessity, of objective connection in nature, etc. Here already we have the contingent and the necessary, the phenomenon and the essence. For when we say, John is a man, Fido is a dog, this is a leaf of a tree, etc., we disregard a number of attributes as contingent. We separate the essence from the appearance and counterpose the one to the other. Thus, in any proposition, we can and must disclose, as in a nucleus or cell, the germs of all the elements of dialectics, and thereby show that dialectics is a property of all human knowledge in general. And natural science shows us, and here again it must be demonstrated in any simple instance, objective nature with the same qualities, the transformation of the individual into the universal, of the contingent into the necessary, transitions, modulations, and the reciprocal connection of opposites. Dialectics is the theory of knowledge of Hegel and Marxism. This is the aspect of the matter. It is not an aspect, but the essence of the matter, to which Plekhanov, not to speak of other Marxists, paid no attention. Knowledge is represented in the form of a series of circles, both by Hegel, see logic, and by the modern, quote, epistemologist of natural science, the eclectic and foe of Hegelianism, which he did not understand, Paul Folkman. See his Erkenntnis Theorische Grundzüge. Circles in philosophy. Is a chronology of persons essential? No. Ancient. From Democritus to Plato and the dialectics of Heraclitus. Renaissance. Descartes versus Gassendi. Spinoza? Modern. Holbach, Hegel, via Berkeley, Hume, Kant. 
Hegel, Feuerbach, Marx. Dialectics as living, many-sided knowledge, with the number of sides eternally increasing, with an infinite number of shades of every approach and approximation to reality, with a philosophical system growing into a whole out of each shade. Here we have an immeasurably rich content as compared with, quote, metaphysical materialism, the fundamental misfortune of which is its inability to apply dialectics to the builder terry, to the process and development of knowledge. Philosophical idealism is only nonsense from the standpoint of crude, simple, metaphysical materialism. From the standpoint of dialectical materialism, on the other hand, philosophical idealism is a one-sided, exaggerated, uberschwengliches, per Dietzken, development, inflation, distension of one of the features, aspects, facets of knowledge into an absolute, divorced from matter, from nature, apotheosis. There's a footnote there about Dietzken, the reference to the use by Josef Dietzken of the term überschwänglich, which means exaggerated, excessive, infinite. For example, in the book Kleinere Philosophische Schriften, Minor Philosophical Writings, Stuttgart, 1903, page 2, Dietzken uses this term as follows, absolute and relative are not infinitely separated. Back to the text. Idealism is clerical obscurantism. True. But philosophical idealism is, quote, more correctly and, quote, in addition, a road to clerical obscurantism through one of the shades of the infinitely complex knowledge, dialectical, of humanity. Human knowledge is not, or does not follow, a straight line, but a curve, which endlessly approximates a series of circles, a spiral. Any fragment segment, section of this curve can be transformed, transformed one-sidedly, into an independent, complete, straight line, which then, if one does not see the wood for the trees, leads into the quagmire, into clerical obscurantism, where it is anchored by the class interests of the ruling classes. Rectilinearity and one-sidedness, woodenness and petrification, subjectivism and subjective blindness, voila, the epistemological roots of idealism, and clerical obscurantism, equals philosophical idealism, of course, has epistemological roots. It is not groundless. It is a sterile flower, undoubtedly, but a sterile flower that grows on the living tree of living, fertile, genuine, powerful, omnipotent, objective, absolute human knowledge. And that is the end of the audiobook. So, again, if this was your first foray into Marxist theory, you didn't take our warning, um... Things are not usually this complicated. This is kind of a fragment. This was not developed. Lenin's writing, as with most Marxist theorists and historians, is usually much more readable than this. In fact, if you would like to go further into dialectics in a much more readable way, I would recommend Mao's On Practice, Mao's On Contradiction, and Stalin's Dialectical and Historical Materialism, among others. I mean, many Marxist authors write on the topic of dialectics. Anyway, what do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comments section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening. And thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. We don't run ads on this channel, so the patron support is vital, and it has allowed me to spend a lot more time on this channel producing content, uploading it, promoting it, all of the things that running this channel requires. And the channel has grown a lot. That is also in part thanks to the video engagement. So like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment, even if it's just thanks or good video. All of that helps to build the channel and boost it in the YouTube algorithm, which makes it easier for random people with questions about society to stumble across this and get on the right track with working class politics. I'd like to note also that this is the first month where in the patron credit screen, you'll see some names in yellow. These are patrons who have been supporting the channel for over a year. Special thanks to them. I wanted to find a way to recognize that, and that's the way we're doing it for now. Anyway, thanks again for watching, and we'll catch you in the next video.